Good morning and welcome to Contemporary Worship with Christ Lutheran Church. Some words from scripture to begin our service from Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn. We confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and each other. We have turned our faces away from you when you did not appear as we expected. 
We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may reflect your love. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory, glory, glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we've heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning, all of you online. Welcome as well as we gather together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the risen Christ. What a Saturday worship experience it must have been. We started last week with part one, if you will, of Jesus' visit to his hometown of Nazareth. And as you all know, he had begun his ministry already of teaching and healing, of proclaiming the kingdom of God. And he came home to Nazareth, to his home congregation, to, to read the lessons, to teach, and to preach. 
And he stands up in that worship and he reads, as you'll recall, Isaiah chapter 61. And Isaiah chapter 61 is the job description, if you will, or the mission statement of the Messiah, the one who had been expected for 1,500 years. And just to refresh your memory, here is what Jesus read from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as Luke tells us, as Luke tells us, Jesus waits a moment, kind of a pregnant pause, and then announces these words. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And you'll recall the congregation is amazed, confused even, stunned. And we can imagine people looking at each other and saying, uh, did you hear what I just heard? Did he really say that? Did he read that and then say that about himself? What does this mean? What does this mean? You know, we live in a world that's infatuated with heroes. We are infatuated with heroes. And really, we always have been, from the earliest caveman and cavewoman who, who looking on the actions of the bravest and best of them, of their clan who brought home the mastodon or, or led them in battle, whatever, to those who have served to bring justice to the world in war or peacetime, to first responders in our day, to healthcare workers, to teachers, to our fictional heroes, Superman, Batman, the Avengers, a billion dollar film industry. We can't get enough of heroes. We just can't. People in whom we see the best of ourselves and are really even qualities beyond our best. So you see, Jesus comes to Nazareth a hero. He comes to Nazareth a hero. He, his reputation precedes him. He's already been out ministering, and now he announces who he truly and fully is, God's anointed one, sent by God to bring freedom from sin and death and guilt and shame, to proclaim the age of jubilee, of the eternal everlasting grace, forgiveness, and peace of the living God. And you can't get much more heroic than that. A few years for Christmas, uh, Carrie Lehman bought me a t-shirt. And on the t-shirt uh, are the superheroes and they're sitting on a bench, right? There's Superman and there's Iron Man and there's Spider-Man and uh, Batgirl, I think, or Batwoman's on there and, and a few others. And sitting in the middle of the superheroes is Jesus. And there's a common commentary bubble above Jesus. And Jesus is saying, and this is what I did to save the world. And the other heroes have their heads in their hands. Superman is sitting, is sitting there shaking his head. Wow, right? You can't get much more heroic than Jesus. And you know what? I, I would imagine that the powers that be in Nazareth had prepared a huge potluck dinner following worship that day, a way to receive Jesus and celebrate his ministry. They probably uh, had a couple fatted calves prepared, and maybe even a dessert of green jello. Just maybe. And maybe they could convince Jesus in turning some water into wine, just like he had done at that wedding in Cana a couple weeks before. And we can imagine the president of the congregation standing up and saying, you, some of you were at that wedding, right? And you remember his mother Mary was in charge of the kitchen that day. We love our heroes. But just like what happened would happen three years down the road. Jesus riding triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey. 
on a Sunday, everybody singing his praises, and then crucified on that Friday, something happened. Something happened. The hero went from hero to zero. From hero to zero. Why? Why? I mean, it, it, as he wrote into Jerusalem, it was five days, the process of going from hero to zero. Here in, in worship, it's like five minutes. It's like one conversation. What happened? How did things go south, go sideways so fast? And what can we learn from it? Well, I think the key turn is, again, in our gospel lesson, and it's, it's uh, verse 22. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Is this not Joseph's son? It's as if in the midst of the, the wonder of it all, the celebration of it all, someone in the back of the room stood up and said, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Before we get all excited and get all carried away about Jesus and Jesus being here, isn't this just Joseph's son? Isn't this just Joseph's son? I mean, think about it, people. A carpenter's son. Now, no offense, Jesus, we really, really like you. You did a great job on my kitchen cabinet a few years ago. A wonderful job. You're a wonderful carpenter, right? But, but you're a, no offense, low-class menial laborer. You're poor. People, would God really work this way? A 1,500-year-old promise, would God really work this way? No, God wouldn't do this. God's anointed one. God sent one. Isn't this just Joseph's boy? Isn't this just Joseph's son? Now, how do we know, how do we know that that question was snarky? How do we know that question was snarky? Because, you know, in some ways it reads like, oh, isn't this Joseph's son? Whoa, amazing. But we know it was snarky by the way Jesus responded to it. Again, our gospel lesson. What does Jesus say in response to that? He says this. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what you've done, what we heard you have done in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, namely the Jewish widows, none of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. In other words, to a Gentile. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed. Not one of the Jewish lepers was cleansed. But only Naaman the Syrian was cleansed. And by the way, in parentheses, if you read the story, Naaman hated the Jews. All the people, verse 28, in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Does this mean the potluck is off? <laughs> Does this mean that, that, that we, you know, I was looking forward to the really good wine. I take it we're not going to have that? From hero to zero in your hometown in one conversation. Wow. Wow. This wasn't the happy ending which these people had signed up for. Sensing their indignation, Jesus adds this dramatic plot twist by reminding the people of two times in their history... When God didn't heal the chosen people, but he went to folks outside 
the chosen people into the Gentile world. He's reminding of them, them of that. And this Messiah was about to embark on doing the same thing, bringing grace to those who most desperately needed it, regardless of whether they were Jewish or Gentiles, or rich or poor. A sure way to go from hero to zero is to remind folks of the painful realities of their own history, which is what Jesus did. It takes only a few minutes for the hometown fans who want no part of making nice with the opposition to change their minds about Jesus. And you know what? This is the way it would be for the next three years, right? The next three years would be like this. Jesus called people to own up to their original an ancient mission as God's chosen people. What was their mission? Their mission was to be a blessing as a country, as a nation, to the rest of the world. To lead people to Christ, to lead people to God. To be a light in the world. And they chose to hide the light instead. Rather than offering the hand of grace, they destroyed and killed. You know, a profound moment that takes place in all the Gospels is Jesus' calling of the disciples. And if we turn to Matthew chapter 4, and again, all the Gospels talk about this, verse 18, it says this, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake because they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. In Luke chapter 5, just right after Jesus is in Nazareth at his home congregation, he calls the disciples and Luke tells us that they left everything to follow Jesus. Here's the thing, brothers and sisters. If you want to be a hero, if you want to follow a hero, you must leave your nets. If you want to be a hero, if you want to follow a hero, you must leave your nets. Even Jesus left his nets behind to be the hero. And we see that, Paul shares that with us, in his letter to the Philippians, the second chapter. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What were the nets Jesus gave up? He gave up his privilege and his right as the Son of God, right? He became humble. He put himself in a position to be nailed to a cross for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. That's a pretty serious net to leave behind, being God's son? What did Peter and Andrew and even Matthew leave behind as disciples to follow Jesus? Well, we've already seen Peter and Andrew left their nets, their livelihood. Matthew was a tax collector, so he left behind him the nets of money and tax collecting. What about the congregation at Nazareth? What were the nets they needed to leave behind but hadn't yet? Well, preconceived notions of themselves as Jews, what their role and mission was, preconceived notions of who the Messiah was, preconceived notions of God's call to them to be blessings to everyone. Their expectations, too, were nets that had to be left. So let me ask you today, what are your nets? What are your nets that must be left behind? What are my nets that I have to leave behind? Are they two expectations or preconceived notions maybe? Maybe it's wealth, 
prestige. Maybe it's time we leave our guilt and shame and our sins in the rearview mirror. Leave those behind too. Leave it all behind, friends, to follow the leader, the hero, the hero, not a hero, but the hero of all creation. I'd like to close with a psalm, Psalm 95. And this is quoted, this section of the psalm is quoted in numerous places in the New Testament. But it goes like this, Psalm 95. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Amen. Please stand for the prayers. Lord God Almighty, as with Jeremiah, 
You planned to use us before we were born. Give us a vision of your providence over time itself, that in our brief earthly lifespans, we may be your useful people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, hope incarnate, sustain us with your love. Fill us with confidence and hear the sounds of our praise. God of grace, hear our hear prayer. Our prayer. Holy Spirit, as you nurture us in life and we pass from childhood to adulthood, fill us with an active faith, a dauntless hope, and a love so real that we know it could only have come from you. God of grace, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Guide your church, O oh God, in the ways of faith, hope, and love. Cultivate ministries and communities of compassion that bear witness to your enduring presence among us. God of grace, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. You, O oh God, and your love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Comfort with your love all who are lonely, fearful, or brokenhearted, and sustain the hope of all those who suffer in body or spirit, especially those that we mention in the silence of our hearts. God of grace, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, Heavenly Father, we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. Just one major announcement to share with you today, and that is the congregational meeting, our annual meeting, will be held following the 11 o'clock service this morning. Uh, there will be no pizza, no lunch served today, again, because of the pandemic. But we hope you will come back and join us following that 11 o'clock service. If you can't be with us, you can uh, watch it via Zoom, and that link is in the announcements today. But we need you here in person, if at all possible, uh, for voting reasons. Again, many ministries and many commissions that we have here in this congregation and opportunities to serve our Lord, consider them as you hear the praise team do the offertory.
Please stand for Holy Communion. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We invite you to pick up the, the little chalice for Holy Communion as Jesus invites us to this holy meal. Peel back the top for the little wafer and then know that this is the body of Christ given for you. And then turn it over, peel back for the grape juice and know that this is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Please stand for the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And now may God who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, may God bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. in peace. Share the light and the love of God. Thanks be to God. Jumps too soon. Okay, I feel like we wanted that one to be longer. It was a test. <laughs> <laughs>